Hey friends, and welcome to the first lecture video for Unit 8, which is all about aquatic and terrestrial pollution. And these two topics kind of get lumped together because oftentimes, oftentimes um, the things that we pollute the, the land with end up in the ocean and vice versa. Whereas when uh, we talked about atmospheric pollution, that was kind of its own thing because um, many pollutants don't have a gaseous phase, and so the ones that do, we want to isolate. But in this unit, we're going to be talking specifically about how we pollute our land, and how we pollute our water, how we can address it, and how that's going to impact our human health, but also the health of the ecosystems and the whole planet. In this unit, we're going to talk about a lot of different things. It's kind of a hodgepodge unit. Uh, we're going to talk about the basics of pollution. We'll talk about aquatic pollution in forms of eutrophication, sewage treatment, and the impacts on different ecosystems. We'll discuss terrestrial pollution in a, a wide variety of different ways. And we'll talk about chemical toxicity in addition to human health and disease. Uh, so there's a whole lot that will be covered in this unit. So there's a lot of material. Just prepare yourself for that. So the basics of pollution that you need to know is that, you know, you probably know what waste is. Waste contributes to pollution, and it's just the useless uh, outputs of a system. And in the system we have now, we produce a lot of waste, particularly in the United States. Uh, although, depending on how you look at it, some of this stuff may not be waste. One person's trash is another person's treasure, am I right? Um, and pollutants can come from one of two, they can be categorized in one of two ways. They can be... Um, come from something called a point source, which is kind of like a single uh, spot that you can identify, such as like a water discharge pipe or a specific smokestack. Or pollution uh, pollutants can come from non-point sources, which are, um, uh, you know, uh, pollutants that gather from a large, broad area that can't be targeted to one specific area, one specific location, one specific source. And that could be things like pesticide spraying, urban runoff, you know, all gathering in the watershed and ending up in the river, polluting this river, but the pollutants are coming from a variety of different areas, not just one specific point. Um, and pollutants can fall into a number of categories in terms of um, their physicality, is it trash, is it sediment, is it temperature, uh, is it biological like a pathogen or a disease, or is it chemical like a heavy metal, oil, pesticides, nutrients, etc. Uh, physical water pollution, you're probably pr quite familiar with this. It, a, a lot of it is uh, solid waste in terms of the garbage and the sludge. Uh, plastic pollution is a major, major problem in the ocean. Uh, we produce a lot of plastic that gets thrown out immediately. Um, although a lot of the pa plastic in this garbage patch, about 45% of it, is fishing nets. Um, so it doesn't all fall on the consumer, but it does fall on our general lifestyle and, and willingness to uh, throw out plastic willy-nilly. Uh, not only is it ugly, but it can lead to intestinal blockage in animals, it's a choking hazard, and many of these plastics can leach toxic chemicals after they've been exposed to UV radiation for significant amounts of time. So they're floating around in there, animals are eating it, choking and dying, and it's also uh, toxic, uh, making the water more toxic. Uh, in addition, there's uh, something called sedimentation. This is any sort of silt, sand, clay, any sort of soil that is being uh, tossed up at the, at the, in a water, a body of water that's going to increase the turbidity. Um, and this can happen behind dams. It can happen due to runoff from agriculture or erosion. If there's been clear cutting in an area, erosion will increase and increase the sedimentation. Not only will this clog gills, but it will also block out the sunlight, making it different, difficult for organisms to see and for plants to photosynthesize. Biological pollutants include things like pathogens and diseases, like Ebola, like SARS, uh, like the coronavirus. Uh, we're not going to talk about those quite yet. Um, I kind of want to section them off into their own video, which will be later in the unit. So um, hold your breath on that. We will get to it. Uh, chemical pollutants, however, are what we'll be spending uh, most of our time on. Um, these guys polluted the music industry. Uh, <laughs> chemical pollutants can include things like heavy metals like mercury, but also lead and arsenic. Um, and oftentimes these will come from mining or fossil fuel combustion. Uh, and they can contaminate the soil, but they can also contaminate groundwater, drinking water, and nearby aquatic ecosystems through runoff. Um, and once it carries these metals into the ecosystem, it only takes a little bit to pollute an entire ecosystem, right? Uh, so if you're combusting fossil fuels in a, in a factory, not only are you producing NOx and SO2 and, you know, particulate matter, but you can also be producing heavy metals like mercury that if they end up in the nearby aquatic ecosystem, they can build up inside the tissues of organisms, they can contaminate the water, contaminate the soil, and pose a risk not only to the organisms living there, but also to humans. 
kids, especially um, uh, uh, pregnant women or young children who are still going through development. Oil is another big chemical pollutant. Uh, you've probably seen photos like these before. Are very, very um, difficult to look at, very sad. Um, these uh, oil can coat the feathers and fur of different uh, marine mammals and birds, making it difficult for them to swim, to stay warm, to fly. Um, these hydrocarbons, uh, like methane or like petroleum, will sink, uh, and then they can uh, to completely cover benthic organisms. Remember, the benthic zone is like the sea floor, uh, so it can kill them, smother them. It can lead to blindness, it can immobilize them, uh, and it can do a lot of damage as well to the economy in terms of the fishing and the tourism industry, so that's not to be overlooked. Now, chemical pollutants can affect living things in a variety of different ways, right? They can smother them, they can blind them, they can choke them, but they can also uh, impact their ecological tolerance, right? We've talked about ecological tolerance before. There's an optimum range of conditions needed for homeostasis for, for the organisms to survive. And if they're outside that range, it can lead to increased stress, lowered growth and reproduction, or even death. Right, uh, there is a ideal range where their tolerance um, is is um, allows them to thrive, and then there's a range in which they will survive as well, and then there's a range outside that where they won't survive at all. And when we think about these pollutants, right, they can change the um, toxicity of the water in terms of things like heavy metals. They can change the pH of the water outside their ecological tolerance, but it can also affect their hormonal system. Uh, many pollutants are endocrine disruptors that will mess with the hormones, uh, hormonal imbalance of the organisms and can actually lead to changes in the sex of the population. It can lead to a variety of different reproductive issues and developmental issues. Hormones are the chemical messengers of your body and when, you're, when an organism is young, those uh, messengers are working overtime. So pollutants can really, really uh, mess up, with, um, mess up the, the hormonal balance that uh, organisms have, including humans. And the way that works is that normally a hormone will bind to a protein receptor on a cell membrane and trigger some sort of response, some chemical response inside the cell. But an endocrine disruptor, like a pollutant, will bind with that protein instead, preventing the hormone from binding and preventing it from doing its job. So it's disrupting the hormones from doing their job. Uh, here's another diagram showing the same thing generally, uh, and it can lead to birth defects, developmental disorders, gender and sex imbalances as well. Um, thankfully, there are indicator species, something we've talked about before, that can give us clues about the health of the ecosystem in regards to different um, indicators such as pH, but also sedimentation, water quality, amount of heavy metals, etc. Um, for example, if you've got fecal coliform bacteria in your water, then you just might have fecal waste contamination. Ha 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 ha. Maybe this guy's a little bit before your time. That was kind of like his uh, format for his jokes. Uh, anyway, for example, if you find fecal coliform bacteria in your water, like E. coli, then you can probably assume we've got some fecal waste contamination somewhere upstream or somewhere uh, on land that's running off into these water sources. Thankfully, there's a lot of legislation that protects the land and, the, and specifically the water. Uh, I'm going to go through some of those now. The Clean Water Act, which we've talked about before, protects surface waters, uh, so waters that are on the surface of the earth, right, not groundwater. It defines acceptable levels of pollutants. It allows EPA to issue per, uh, permits for those pollutants, kind of like a cap and trade. They help maintain wetland ecosystem. They fund research for sewage treatment. Uh, they do regular testing. Uh, they administer fees to companies that are violating these standards, right? So they will set the standards, they'll assess the water quality, they'll issue permits, and they'll enforce those limits, right? So the Clean Water Act does a lot for surface water. The Safe Drinking Water Act, on the other hand, regulates water that is not on the surface, underground, uh, groundwater, aquifers, which is where we get a lot of our drinking water. So this law sets national drinking water standards and sets a maximum level of containment, uh, con contaminants for 77 different elements, um, but it does not include fracking, uh, which is kind of a workaround there. Um, and it's been around since the mid-70s, um, but it's done a lot to help protect our drinking water. Another major law is the CERCLA, or the Superfund Act of 1980. 
A CERCLA stands for a Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act. And uh, what this will do is it will tax the chemical and petroleum industries uh, in terms of their waste disposer, uh, but it also funds the cleanup of abandoned hazardous waste sites, of which there are a lot. Every single dot here represents some sort of abandoned hazardous waste site. Could be an old factory, could be an old uh, processing plant for petroleum, um, and the oftentimes will have signs up, uh, and these Superfund sites are, are really important that we clean up because oftentimes there's a lot of hazardous waste just sitting there that is leaching out into the surrounding environment. Um, unfortunately, this act has a history of environmental racism. Uh, there's a history of delaying responses for cleaning up Superfund sites in black and indigenous communities. Uh, an example is the Church Rock uranium mill spill in New Mexico in 1979 which is on indigenous land. Uh, and there's also Warren County, North Carolina, 1983. Um, uh, and that uh, in that county, oh, I've got the wrong state there, my bad. Um, and in that county, there was a uh, landfill that was leaching out chemicals called PCBs, uh, polychlorobiphenyl. And we'll talk about those later in the unit, but these are endocrine disruptors. They can do a lot, a lot of damage to uh, the human system, the human development. Um, and this landfill was built in a predominantly black community, and uh, even though they knew there were issues there, uh, it took a really long time for get to, to, uh, to clean that area up. A lot of protests, and this kind of started the environmental justice movement uh, in the 80s, yeah, 1983. We'll talk more about this stuff uh, as we move throughout the unit. Um, but unfortunately, environmental justice is actually quite rife throughout this entire topic of pollution, uh, whether it's plastic, uh, whether it's fertilizer, uh, whether it's uh, PCBs in Warren County, uh, whether it's DDT or even uh, the drinking water in a place like Flint. There are lots of lots of examples of pollution that is impacting disproportionately um, black communities, dis disproportionately indigenous communities, uh, and very little being done to address that issue. Uh, so that's definitely an area where we need to make sure that we're aware and that we're focusing on going forward. Uh, another piece of legislation that I'm sure you've all been waiting for, it is time to discuss the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. Now that's what I call legislation. Uh, this has come up a couple times earlier in the class because people keep picking it on tests, even though we haven't talked about it yet. But now we're talking about it, and so now you can start picking it as an answer on tests. Congratulations. So the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act governs the generation, transportation, treatment, storage, and disposal of solid and hazardous waste. This includes things like household cleaning products, like... Um, you know, bleach, uh, but also hairspray, motor oil, glue, uh, you know, old light bulbs, uh, car batteries, gasoline, pesticides, fungicides, etc. Um, pretty much any sort of toxic or hazardous chemical they might have laying around your house. And it sets standards for managing that waste. Um, and these laws are really important because they help protect uh, the cleanliness of our, our water, and clean water is not a universal resource. We talked about earlier in the year how um, many people don't have access to potable water and have to spend hours a day just gathering water, which prevents them from going to school, which increases the total fertility rate in those communities. But even in the United States, we've got issues like uh, Flint, Michigan, right, where a whole community, and not just Flint, but other cities like it, don't have access to clean water and basically have to shower, cook, and drink bottled water for years on end. Right? So clean water is not a, a, a given right. It is a privilege, and we need to make sure that we're protecting it. Um, uh, Forty percent of the world lacks proper access to sanitation and hygiene. Uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, up to 64 percent of people lack access to those things. Um, and um, as I mentioned before, women can spend up to six hours a day gathering water, which is severely going to limit their ability to educate themselves, to uh, take care of the family, to start a career, etc. And that's going to raise the birth rate um, and uh, prevent the population from moving through the demographic transition. Uh, additionally, when we think about water, uh, it's important that we think about the aquatic ecosystems. Um, the, the, all of these different types of pollutants that I've talked about and all the different types of laws and regulations uh, surrounding those pollutants are all meant to uh, protect aquatic ecosystems and terrestrial ecosystems as well, but I'm, I'm going to focus on aquatic ones. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a couple right now, just as some case studies to look at how anthropogenic pollution impacts aquatic ecosystems. And these are pretty important. Uh, uh, for example, let's talk about wetlands. Wetlands are my favorite 
biome, um, not going to lie, favoritism, but um, wetlands are, is an ecosystem that is either uh, uh, totally or partially flooded by water, could be periodically flooded by water, different times of the year, um, includes things like swamps, mash, marshes, mangroves, and bogs, and these wetlands uh, are also mangroves, which are um, trees that actually grow in the water along tropical shorelines. Uh, they are they are able to tolerate not only the water but the saltiness of the water, um, and their roots underneath the water provide habitat and shelter for invertebrates and baby fish and even some birds. Um, and now all wetlands, whether it's a mangrove or a marsh or whatever, uh, will provide things like uh, habitat, of course, uh, but they will also control the floods. They will help protect from storms. If you look in this little gif here, you could see that a mangrove along the coast is significantly decreasing the wave energy from reaching the shore, um, which is a much better barrier than anything you know you could design or engineer. Mangroves have a huge impact on storm protection. Um, wetlands in general can also help purify and filter the water, and they are massive, massive carbon sinks. Here's a picture of me uh, doing some research in a salt marsh in Georgia. Um, look at all of this grass, um, and it is uh, all sucking up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and storing that in its roots and in the soil. Um, unfortunately, uh, uh, no, not, not at the downsides yet. Um, so hold off on that, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, uh, wetlands can serve as habitat and nursery for a variety of birds and invertebrates, amphibians, you name it. Uh, a third of all species of birds nest in uh, wetlands. Uh, unfortunately, now we get to the unfortunately, there are some significant threats. Uh, de human development, the construction of dams that alters the watershed, overfishing of these ecosystems can lead to trophic cascades. Climate change and sea level rise. Many wetlands, if you look in this photo, are very flat and very low sea level. So a little bit of sea level rise can flood this entire wetland, uh, which is going to drown out some of these species. Um, additionally, of course, pollutants, agricultural and industrial, which is the topic of this unit. Another major aquatic ecosystem that is threatened by pollutants are coral reefs. Um, so let's dig into a little bit because coral reefs, they uh, provide intense they're foundation species. They're, they, they are the basis for a whole entire biome of coral reefs. So they support a huge swath of biodiversity. And as a result, they're providing food and tourism. They also provide storm protection and a variety of medicine. About um, uh, a significant chunk of the medicine that we get comes from corals or organisms that live in coral reefs. Um, and corals have a mutualistic relationship, which means that uh, there are two organisms living together in close contact that are both benefiting from one another. There's the coral, and then there's something called a zooxanthellae, which is a type of algae uh, that does photosynthesis. Um, and so this algae lives inside the, the coral, and the coral provides protection for the zooxanthellae. Meanwhile, the zooxanthellae do photosynthesis and share the energy they create with the coral. So the issue becomes if you kill one of these things, you end up killing both. Uh, so there are some physical threats to coral reefs. Obviously, there's damage from boats and fishing and uh, divers and chains and things dragging along the bottom, like bottom trawling. Um, there's also uh, overfishing and overharvesting of coral reefs, blast fishing, you know, any sort of dis physical disruption to that ecosystem. Sedimentation, we already talked about, can block the light, which prevents zooxanthellae from doing photosynthesis, which can cause the coral reefs to die. Um, there are plastic waste. Again, something we've already talked about. Microplastics can lodge inside the polyps of the corals, um, uh, impacting their ability to digest, impacting their uh, endocrine system, their hormones, right? So it can have significant impacts on them. It can also cover them up, right, with like a plastic bag and make photosynthesis difficult. Um, this could also be chemical, depending on how you look at it, um, microplastics. Uh, An additional rising sea temperatures, uh, as this temperatures rise, it, it goes out of the zone of ecological tolerance for the zooxanthellae. So if it gets too hot, the zooxanthellae gets stressed out and eventually they die, which causes the coral to go through a process called bleaching, where basically all the zooxanthellae die. So the coral then dies and it turns completely white. And it looks kind of cool, but it actually means that the entire uh, coral reef has died. Um, other biological or biological threats to coral reefs include things like invasive species. Predators like lionfish and crown of thorns starfish can disrupt those ecosystems. Pathogens like black band, band disease can take out entire coral colonies in a matter of weeks. Um, and there are chemical threats to coral reefs. I kind of mentioned microplastics already, but there's ocean acidification. We'll talk about more, more about this specific topic later in the year. But as carbon dioxide dissolves into the water, uh, it will create carbonic acid and 
corals have a calcium skeleton. So this carbonic acid will start to dissolve their skeleton and over time it just totally uh, kill them. Oil spills, we mentioned oil, how it can suffocate, but it can also lead to chemical imbalances uh, of hormones and endocrine uh, disruptors. Nutrient pollution is also a big issue for corals. Uh, not only does it promote algal growth in the water, which can block out the sunlight, uh, but in intense amounts of nutrients can actually affect the early life of corals. Uh, young little baby corals will actually uh, have a harder time surviving because of increased nutrient pollution. And there are other toxins as well, uh, herbicide and pesticide runoff, heavy metal runoff, but sunscreens as well. Uh, so if you put a lot of sunscreen on, you get in the ocean, uh, that can negatively impact the reproduction and growth of corals. It can damage the symbiotic relationship with the zooxanthellae. Uh, so there are some uh, general, uh, uh, you know, there are types of sunscreen you can buy that are coral safe. Um, but if you look at the impacts, um, you know, of sunscreen on corals, it can impair their growth, um, not just on corals, uh, but it can actually lead to hormonal imbalances in fish. Uh, it can be accumulate in the tissue of uh, marine mammals. It can induce defects in invertebrates and their young. Uh, it can damage the immune and reproductive system. So, you know, you can see it's pretty uh, substantial issues. Uh, so stay in the shade, use umbrellas, hats, uh, wear, use coral safe, sunblock, etc. Even if you're in a lake or something like that, uh, sunblock can have impacts on the organisms living there. Uh, okay, so that's going to do it. I know there's a lot in this video, uh, so please come to class with your questions, and then we will continue on our educational journey together. Adios.